Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today on our fourth annual Canada uh, Symposium. Allow me first to start with the land acknowledgement. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nation and people, European and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. For those who doesn't know me, my name is Dr. Reem El Saleh. I am a Middle Eastern woman with a mid-tone the skin tone and wearing um, a button scarf with a uh, blue and gray and a gray uh, button up uh, shirt. My background showing a blurry image of a school hall and my pronunciation is she here. I am an associate professor at the graphic communication uh, management program, part of the creative school at Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm a proud instructor of a unique asset management course at TMU and the co-founder and the director of the Lab of Excellent in Digital Asset Management. I want to welcome you to the Fourth Canada Dam Symposium Gathering, where we come together to share a story and celebrate our success in implementing uh, digital asset management or uh, dam field. This year is a really extra special as we go going to unveil ex exciting uh, new research projects from the LED lab. We will be also honoring winners of the Best Student Dam Creative Award. And let's uh, not forget the fun. Get ready for some amazing Nandor prize and giveaways. And of course, the grand prize at tuition of one of the Dam Professional Certificate classes at Rutgers University. I can't wait to hear uh, from our inspiring uh, speakers and kick off the celebration. Allow me first uh, to uh, go uh, for, uh, over some housekeeping. Please note that this symposium is recorded. Uh, the recording link is going to be shared after today's event. The closed caption has been enabled. Uh, you can be you can view it by clicking on the show caption icon in the meeting control uh, toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. To make sure that we are focused on the event, your video and mic are uh, locked. Kindly, please keep them uh, muted all the time during the event. We will have a Q&A session after each, uh, each session. Uh, you can post your question in the chat or you can use the Q&A uh, feature, which is also located in the control bar in your Zoom. I will be uh, moderating the chat, so please feel free to uh, send a direct message to me uh, if you have any question. We're also looking for some engagement so uh, and building a community, so please use the, the chat to add your LinkedIn profile uh, link. And with that, I would like to introduce my co-host, David Lipsy, a well-known expert in uh, dam technology and the master head behind so many dam initiatives, including the launching of LED Lab. David, over to you. Reem, thanks so very much. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to welcome, and in this case, a global audience interested in digital asset management. And in that context, I say good evening, where it's 9 p.m. in Karachi, Pakistan, and thank you very much for sharing part of your later evening with us. Digital asset management has so many tap roots. It grew up as part of a little bit of, a, of an orphan in the digital world in kind of a funny way with many, many, many different places who are, that were trying to rear it. But as it's emerged from kind of a fractured, a bit of a, a, a bit of a fractured past, it's come ever more to represent an opportunity for enterprise engagement of software that can go to work and do so many different things. We certainly see this reflected in our colleagues who are speaking with us today. I've enjoyed working with each of them. I know you'll enjoy their presentations. As Reem has shepherded the growth of what started first as an undergraduate teaching class in digital asset management, and as I always like to ask at the various conferences that I'm privileged to go to, how many of us took DAM as an undergraduate? And boy, the share of hands is really tiny unless some of Reem's students are in there. That the coalescence around 
a better fusion of knowledge of DAM, with DAM having education coming, starting at the undergraduate level, with DAM at LED now having a professional university-focused loci for research involving digital asset management. And on that note, Reem and I encourage each and every one of you to ask for a sabbatical and let us house your research at LED and at TMU. The wider meanings of digital asset management and not having us be constrained to a similar kind of uh, departmental uh, narrowness to the application continues to unfold, which I'm so happy to see. DAM never ends up where it starts. Its beginnings could be in marketing, communications, in archives, libraries, in other purpose-built projects, as we'll hear about today. But DAM's very restless. It likes to move around. And I personally really like that. It presents enormous governance issues. It presents a lot of leadership challenging issues because many times there's a more formal approach to assimilating new digital technologies into an organization. And the IT staff or the CIO or the CTO are not quite used to something like this that starts somewhere and typically when deployed successfully ends up someplace different, maybe six someplaces different. So we are delighted to have a chance to explore many of those different places today. Um, we will welcome, as Reem said, questions throughout the day. And we've got some fun, non, as we like to call them, non-door prizes and a pretty terrific drawing for professional education from Rutgers University at the end of our session today. One of the if ever there, let me start that again. If ever there were a set of lock picks that I want to have secreted away in my sport court pocket as I wander around trying to find an asset, it's ever better metadata. If ever I was walking along the side of the beach or the, the lake and I found the proverbial journey, we all know what we'd rub that lamp for after asking for more questions, more metadata. As we explore the ever-changing boundaries of metadata through the, the kind of intrusion and opportunities of AI, through ever better machine learning tools, through metadata that expresses itself without our having to intervene, although we always want that ethical and legal and moral check on metadata, we also want metadata to be ever more accessible. To that end, we start our presentations today with a presentation from Megan Toy entitled Metadata for Born Accessible Digital Content. It's been a real treat for me to spend time with Megan. Um, much of digital asset management originated in the complexities of multiple markup content objects. And Megan is grappling continuing today with the horizons of how do we make more and more content arrive with accessible metadata Content objects always set the trend for the rest of DAM. So, Megan, we're delighted to have you welcomed to the event, and I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Thank you, David. Um, okay, I'll share my screen here. Success. Yeah. What about now? Still success? Still success. <laughs> okay, good. good, good. All right. Well, hello and welcome. Um, so today I will describe, or I'm going to discuss how to describe and manage and enable the discovery of accessible digital assets using metadata. I'm also going to give a brief overview of some of the challenges in this area and how it is currently being taken up within digital publishing. But first, a little bit about me. Uh, I am currently the Accessible Digital Asset and Metadata Coordinator at the Center for Equitable Library Access. We are a nonprofit that produces, publishes, and distributes accessible reading materials for people with print disabilities across Canada. So for those not familiar, a print disability can be defined as a learning, physical, or visual disability that prevents someone from reading conventional print materials. So this can be, for example, blindness or low vision, um, difficulty with comprehension, 
or the inability to hold a print book. Formerly, I was a PhD candidate in art history at York University, uh, where I studied the intersection of disability studies and feminism within contemporary art. So as I was conducting research for my PhD in various archives and uh, libraries, uncovering hidden gems and assisting with digitization, I was introduced to this magical thing called metadata and it's a love story from there. <laughs> um, but, but I really am very passionate about the role metadata plays in facilitating access to digitized resources. So that led me to my current position at CELA today. And I'll talk a little bit about what, what I do at CELA. So currently at CELA, I manage and coordinate our incoming and outgoing digital files for our accessible resource collection. We work with our production partners to convert print books into accessible formats, such as DAISY audiobooks, Braille and eBooks. But we also purchase digital materials and remediate them in-house. So we're doing this a lot with commercial audiobooks where we're adding structure, table of contents, navigational aids to then create what's called a DAISY audiobook. And then we also acquire and distribute born accessible formats from various publishers and vendors. So you might be wondering, what is a born accessible format? So simply defined, born accessible is a digital artifact that was produced with accessibility in mind. Um, in CELA's context, this is mostly coming from digital books that are coming to us. They're already accessible. Um, accessibility was really baked into the publisher's workflow from the start, and there's really no need for us to then go remediate uh, or convert into an alternate format down the line. And we're seeing more and more digital content being born accessible. So there's accessible PDFs, there's audio and video files with captions and tra transcripts, there's images with sufficient alternative text. These are just a few examples. So content creators are mo motivated to create accessible content because after all, accessibility is good for everyone and it's great for usability, and it's not just for people with disabilities. And there's also the context of disability legislation. Uh, in the EU in particular, there's the European Accessibility Act that will require that all eBooks in the European supply chain be fully accessible by 2025. Um, and in Canada, we have the Accessible Canada Act, which aims to create the barrier-free Canada by 2040. So currently that is only applying to organizations under federal federal responsibility, but this could evolve. And of course, there's also provincial level level le legislation. So there's the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And all of this has created kind of a, a groundswell when it comes to the creation of, of accessible digital content. And it pre presents really an opportunity, but also really a need for organizations to describe promote and enable the discovery of digital assets based on their users' accessibility needs or preferences. So with that, a little bit of a hypothetical user story. So say the digital communications coordinator with the government of Ontario is tasked with creating and publishing uh, a new educational campaign on the website. Under AODA, all content published on the website must meet the web content accessibility guidelines. The coordinator thinks, what does WCAG AA compliance mean? And maybe after reviewing some internal guidelines and training, they learn they need to find and use digital assets and content that are accessible. So a couple examples would be audiovisual materials with complete text captions and corresponding transcript, or PDFs that have heading navigation, document structure tags, alternative text for images, and are compatible with a screen reader. So searching through the digital asset management system, the coordinator thinks, how do I know which one of these PDFs is accessible? You would need to have access to Adobe Pro and knowledge of how to check for proper heading markup, document structure, OCR of text, alternative text, and within that PDF. Did we create or retain alternative text for this image? Checking every image, seeing if there's alternative text or creating them, creating alternative text right then. And then there's also the issue of captioning. It's very time consuming and inefficient to really have to go up, open up the content, verify, make sure the captioning is accurate and complete. So luckily 
There is an easier solution for this that doesn't involve all that time consuming and efficient effort, and that is accessibility metadata. So accessibility metadata really describes the features of an asset that make it accessible. They can also describe the primary modes of access. So for example, if it's a primarily visual or textual resource, and it can also indicate accessibility barriers. I'm gonna focus mostly on the features uh, vocabulary today, but tagging the content using accessibility metadata is gonna allow creators to describe the accessibility features of their digital content upon creation. And this will really future-proof it so those accessibility checks don't have to be done down the line. Um, it'll allow digital asset managers to then retain and know which content is accessible and which accessibility features their content has. And that would be upon acquisition or retention. And it's going to enable users to really search and discover content based on their accessibility needs. So currently, um, there is a controlled vocabulary used within digital publishing to describe accessible features of the asset. And this is the accessibility properties vocabulary from schema.org. So a side note on this is that the controlled vocabularies are currently under review um, and they're getting built upon through the accessibility metadata network, which is formed by the International Federation of Libraries Association. Um, so we're looking at the controlled vocabularies and crosswalks for some of these standards, so stay tuned. And so the scope and best practices for applying schema.org terms um, to various like different forms of digital content is still kind of in the works. Um, it's been pretty well defined for EPUBs, but we're looking at it now from a broader lens. So a little bit emergent and not fully worked out yet, but I think we can still look at a few examples here and tags that can be applied. So one first one is structural navigation. So this tag would indicate that the resource uses headings that fully and accurately reflect the document hierarchy. So for an example, um, each chapter in an ebook is marked up with H1 tags with the subchapters marked up with H2 tags. This would allow a screen reader user to navigate easily between the sections. There's also closed captions. So it indicates that there's synchronized closed captions available. An example would be a YouTube video plays, uh, displays textual captions for the audio content. These can be turned on or off. And then this allows a user with a hearing disability to access that auditory content via um, textual display. There's the tagged PDF uh, property. So the contents of the PDF have been tagged to permit access by assistive technologies. So an example is a PDF has structural tags that indicate the different content types and their relationship to each other within the document, such as section tags, lists, tables, or figures. This is gonna allow a screen reader user to navigate between the different content types and perceive the document's components. And display transformability. So this is when the displayed properties are controllable by the user. So a user with low vision can adjust the font type and text size of an ebook to fit their reading needs. In Adobe InDesign, accessibility metadata tags for EPUBs can be easily added under the metadata tab. So there are some gaps and challenges in this space, and we have a bit of a chicken or the egg problem when it comes to accessibility metadata. So digital content creators uh, aren't adding the metadata because one, there is a lack of awareness that options for adding accessibility metadata exist, and two, the digital asset management either that they either use or that say their content partners use downstream doesn't store accessibility metadata. So What's the point on creating it if there's nowhere to put it? Um, and then digital asset management systems aren't storing the accessibility metadata because they're not getting enough of it from the content providers. So why can they reconfigure their system to accommodate or to store this information if it's not getting consistently supplied or sent? And then content management systems aren't exposing or displaying the accessibility metadata because they might be using a backend DAM system that doesn't store it. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. <laughs> um, however, we do need to start somewhere and progress is being made. 
particularly within the publishing industry. So in the area of creation, we're seeing more and more publishers are providing accessi accessibility metadata in their files and libraries are crosswalking that into their catalog records. Um, this is still emerging, um, but we're beginning to see more and more of it and best practices are being defined. As I mentioned, Adobe InDesign recently updated their EPUB export feature to allow content creators to add those metadata tags when exporting files. So that was really big in, this, in the context of creation. In the area of storage, recently CoreSource, a major distribution and digital asset management platform used in publishing, added the ability to import, store, and distribute accessibility metadata tags. And Book Connect, a metadata management system also used in publishing, has an integrated way for publishers to add, store, and redistribute accessibility metadata through their files. And lastly, we are seeing it surface on websites and catalogs. So one example is Vital Source. This is an e-textbook platform. It provides an accessibility tab for each book. And in that tab, it states what the accessibility features are and provides a plain language summary of the accessibility features. And there is also the National Network for Equitable Library Service. So they map those really kind of technical schema.org terms to more user-friendly labels and display them on each of the book records. They also provide an option for the user to filter by the accessibility feature. So um, with all that being said, the digital asset management and the systems that support it are really uniquely situated between content creation and content discovery. And so the more they are able to store and distribute accessibility metadata, the more encouraged content creators will be to supply it and the more websites will be able to display it. Um, <clears throat> tags uh, that reflect the schema.org vocabulary can be applied at the asset level and those tags can then be given a user-friendly label and displayed for discovery. And although accessibility metadata is mostly being taken up within digital publishing currently, I think it's a really important aspect for consideration that can be applied to all types of digital asset. So again, accessibility is for everyone and an inaccessible digital asset management system is not an equitable one. There's also lots to consider for the accessibility of the DAM software itself, not just the asset it contains. So. Uh, for example, it, it's useful to consider if it can be used and navigated by a keyboard only. Does it have logical keyboard focus? Do the buttons in the dam have proper labels? Does it provide multiple means of input and control? So being able to just drag and drop files into that folder would not pass accessibility requirements. There must be multiple modes of access that don't require, uh, rely solely on visual uh, means. And um, although there, there's some standards that are getting adopted in Canada more broadly now, so recently Accessibility Standards Canada uh, announced that they're adopting the EN 301-5549 standard. And this is um, mostly, it's only for ICT, so information communication technology, but there is a section 11 that addresses software that I think can be really digged into and looked at. Um, and although it's a, very, it's a voluntary standard at this point, it really just signals that there's a larger and more important move for digital accessibility in Canada. And I think we can all embrace and pre prepare for that. And that is, any questions? Megan, thanks so much for that. Mm -hmm. no we did have one question come in that asked, and, and it kind of summarizes another note that I got, which is, does your organization help when we are generally trying to understand better at a general level? And I'm sum summarizing here, what accessibility, what, what lenses do we look at for a dam system? Certainly with what you've just shared, but more broadly, do you help? Does SELA help us look at knowing whether we're, doing, we're on the right track or not? Let's say it that way. Is it in SELA scope? Yes. Uh -huh. for, yeah. For assessing digital asset management systems for accessibility. Uh, 
just to even to help give guidance on here's some tips and tricks about what to look for? Yeah, I mean, I think to an extent, for sure. Um, there's definitely room for guidance there, and we are a great resource for that. Um, and so is the Accessible Publishing Learning Network. They have um, a, a wealth of resources online that can help provide guidance on that. Um, but generally, like just in terms of scope for CELA, we're, we are mostly focused on libraries and such, but we do, you know, we there's lots of dams in libraries and um, yeah, so to an extent, I would say. Um, okay. that's a, yeah. I think that's a perfectly fair answer. We had mm -hmm. a, another question come in. Um, are accessibility metadata features required for all publications distributed in Ontario? So use this to say what the current regulatory state of affairs is, either provincially or federally. I don't know. No. As far as I know, uh, it's not required. Okay. No. And is there... Can you give a general comment, Megan, about what is where the regulatory in convocation or invocation starts either at the provincial or at the federal level? Um, can you reframe that for me, David? Sorry. What do you is it? Uh, well, let me I'll toss this over yeah. to to Reem also, uh, which it could be because yeah. she teaches some of this. And then the Overall report, Laura Brady, thank you for posting in the chat the accessibility meta, metadata report that, and it says my report, Laura, that you must have been involved with. Thank you. And Reem, let's toss that question over to you about provincial or uh, federal accessibility requirements, particularly for metadata. Um, I don't have the uh, the right answer for that, but we have an expert actually in the meeting. Laura Brady is an expert in is she is an accessibility expert in in publishing. So, um, Laura, would you uh, can I put you on the spot and <laughs> can answer the question on, on the chat, please? I mean, you mean have her talk with us now, Reem, or answer it via the? Oh, chat? you can. Um... You cannot unmute. Okay, so I can. Uh, okay, Laura. So I am going to allow you to unmute yourself because you are an expert, and this is a really great. Um, okay, Laura, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm happy to speak to this. So far as I know, there are no requirements in Ontario or Canada regarding dis writing or displaying accessibility metadata. It's becoming more and more of a common practice, and there's a few sites that are exposing accessibility metadata, particularly for books, and I'll, I'll pop in a few links in the chat in a second. <clears throat> this is the, the, it's trending, and this is the direction we're going in, partly because, as Megan said, of the European Accessibility Act, which is bearing down and is due to ripple throughout the book publishing industry. I hope Laura, that helps. Yeah, it's great. Thanks so much for that. Mm -hmm. We'll appreciate Thanks, some Laura. in the chat. And Reem and Megan, let me thank you both, Megan, for your presentation. Uh, very, it's been really fun working with you on this. Our next speaker is Timothy Arthur, who is here with the very well-known Toronto International Film Festival, and who have been very thoughtful about setting some context that we're going to have some fun with after Timothy's presentation. Um, this is a little bit of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I became a digital asset manager, would be another title for uh, what's what has uh, occurred in Tim's career Tim, I've so enjoyed working with you and getting to know you a bit more past, since our past meetings. And over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for uh, having me today. Uh, this is a wonderful event and I love everything that the uh, the lab is doing. So um, glad to be in Toronto with you. So let me get this uh, screen share started. Always the Awkward part at the beginning. Let's see here.
One moment. Ah, here we are. Okay, I believe yes. <laughs> you're on. I'm on the wrong slide, however. Okay, let's uh, back way up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that All looks right. like a first slide. Thanks. With that, let's and off here. we go. Um. So I'm Timothy Arthur, uh, as uh, David. Uh, kindly introduced me. Um, I, I'm I'm the digital asset librarian here at TIFF, and um, I joined TIFF back in September of 2023 to lead the implementation of its very first full dam system. So I'm super excited to be here today um, to show you some early progress from our, from our project. So first, a little bit of background about TIFF and its digital assets. So TIFF is a not-for-profit cultural organization, and our mission is to transform the way people see the world through film. And in service of this mission, we offer screenings, lectures, discussions, festivals, and more. So this includes both our namesake, the Toronto International Film Festival, and also our incredibly rich year-round offerings. So that's why we tend to use the acronym TIFF to refer to the organization. So as you can imagine, um, pursuing this mission involves leveraging a huge variety of digital assets. and um, as a nonprofit, when we think about the value of digital assets, we're always thinking about their value in upholding our charitable mission rather than their monetary value. So TIFF has a history of nearly 50 years now, um, since its founding in 1976 as the uh, Festival of Festivals. And throughout the years, our brand identity has changed many times. Um, and in addition, for each year's festival, we also create a little bit of a different spin, a little bit of a different flavor for our branding, as you can see from these posters over the years, um, spanning from the minimalism of our first edition to some uh, cinephile babies, it seems, back in uh, 1998, to uh, our 2017 edition, which is a little bit more in line with the contemporary branding, but again, showing its own flavor for the year. So, imagine, so managing um, these evolving brand assets is a really important challenge for our DAM project. As well, TIFF manages a really vast archive of hundreds of thousands of images from photographic coverage of past year's festivals and year-round events. This includes things like uh, premieres, red carpets, um, and other special events. And some of these are commissioned freelance work uh, from photographers that we hire ourselves, while others are licensed coverage from image aggregators that we have special relationships with. So rights management is another really important challenge here. In addition, we must also manage all of the promotional materials we license for each of the hundreds of films we program each year. So this includes things like stills, trailers, posters, director headshots, and more. And in this context as well, uh, rights and, and uh, programming information for the events uh, related to these films are, are particularly important to include. TIFF is also home to the, uh, the Film Reference Library, where I'm personally located, um, which is dedicated to preserving Canadian cinema heritage. And our collections include reference resources, film materials, and archival materials, um, perhaps most famously our Cronenberg collection, uh, which has a lot of odd stuff like storyboards and models from Cronenberg's films, uh, this being a storyboard from a, an obscure Nike commercial that Cronenberg directed and a very bizarre one, in fact, uh, and a model, uh, an early model from the fly. Um, so before 2022, all of these millions of digital assets uh, were managed with general cloud storage. So we struggled with all of the usual problems. It was hard to find assets. There's a lot of duplication of assets and, and of work uh, going on across teams. And our rights management processes were somewhat inconsistent, though we had licenses alongside uh, our assets. They were not 
linked in any way. And we were not able to integrate our assets with our other data systems. So like our, and this includes um, our really crucial event management system, which includes all of our programming and uh, the film reference libraries collections management pro system, which includes all of its catalog records. So at this stage, we were focused on the assets in our collections themselves. We were focused on things. We knew we had a lot of stuff and we knew that its value wasn't being fully leveraged. And then our focus would shift when in 2022, a donor took the initiative themselves to generously fund an enterprise dam system for TIP. Now, compared to most organizations, uh, dam acquisitions, we got things a little bit backwards. So rather than beginning with an involved needs assessment and a vendor search, we were given a system and then tasked with adapting it to our needs. So at this point, our focus shifted again to the system itself. We started thinking about how we could leverage the technical tools it offered in order to manage all of this content. And we began with great enthusiasm. Uh, we knew the DAM system had wonderful features like advanced faceted search, AI metadata enrichment, and streamlined asset distribution tools. So the IT department launched forward and spent a year leading batch ingestion of 2 million assets from cloud storage. So we had a great platform and a lot of great content, as you've seen, but at the time it wasn't being used. And it really quickly became clear that we need someone dedicated uh, full-time to the task of working with teams in the organization to understand their needs and to align the DAM impl implementation with these needs. And this is where I entered and the focus shifted to people. So my path to the DAM world started in a somewhat unusual way with a degree in cognitive science. And the core question I was thinking about at the time was, how do humans and computers process information? What's similar about the two and what's different? Later on, I found a way to apply this interest within my master's in library and information studies. Here I was considering, how can we make information more useful or how can, and especially, um, how can we apply computers towards this? Following my master's, I started working in various metadata management roles where I was driven by the related question of how we can best contextualize information to give it meaning. So I applied this in contexts like describing digital collections in a university library, migrating subject headings to a machine readable format, and minutely describing the contents of magazine advertisements for a research project. But when I heard about the opportunity at TIFF, I was instantly drawn by TIFF's mission and its impact. What, what better place I thought could there be to apply everything I'd learned so far about making information useful? So the stars aligned and in September of, tw of 2023, I moved to Toronto uh, from Alberta and I joined TIFF as its first digital asset librarian. So now the DAM project was in full swing at TIFF. We now had a collection of digital assets, um, a full featured digital asset management system, and a dedicated digital asset manager. We were able to shift focus and really start thinking about the verb digital asset management. So as the digital asset manager myself, I need to learn about TIFF's digital assets and the DAM system. But most importantly, I need to get to know the people at TIFF and learn about how TIFF works as an organization. This is fundamental to begin aligning our DAM processes with different teams functions. So from the outset, um, a primary focus has been on developing governance policies and structures for the DAM project. These allow us to create mechanisms for aligning each of these facets. This is hard work, but uh, and no DAM system can do it for you, but it pays dividends. One of the ways that we've worked to align these pillars is by defining metadata standards. We've now developed descriptive systems for each of our sets of assets and started integrating our other data sources. For instance, we've begun importing catalog entries from our film reference library's collections management system. Previously, catalog information and collections assets were largely siloed within the film reference library. But by integrating this information within the DAM, 
we can now tap into existing cataloging processes and leverage them within the new DAM system to broaden access to our collections across the entire organization. And perhaps my favorite example of how we've aligned our DAM system with TIFFS processes is our work with AI face recognition. So with my background in cognitive science, I've had both great interest and great suspicion in AI innovations and cataloging. In particular, the advanced face recognition feature of our DAM system caught my interest early on. A query that so often comes up is users looking for images of specific stars and directors. And given the sheer size of our event coverage archive in particular, it would have taken years to manually tag each photo with names. So our DAM system was set up with a face recognition feature out of the box that would group all images of the same person under one name. All we needed to do was to populate the database of names. So we played to our strengths. Um, one of the greatest strengths we have at TIFF is our amazing pool of volunteers. So we recruited a team of film buffs to help identify these faces. Now it's a work in progress and we've identified now about a quarter of the 10,000 faces um, uh, picked out by the AI model. But now even with that, um, that fraction identified, our, our vast back catalog of event co coverage is accessible in a way that wouldn't have been possible without help from AI and especially without help from our amazing volunteers. In addition, um, we ran an automated deduplication process, which decreased our total number of assets from 2 million to 1.4 million. So huge decrease, a huge amount of duplication that was going on beforehand, uh, even more than we were aware of. So this is about more than the number of assets that we have or about the amount of storage space in the DAM system. This is about centralizing resources to increase collaboration, limit risk, and reduce duplicated work. So these are just a few early results, and I'm certain that many challenges lie ahead. For example, we're just starting to think about managing our in-house video content uh, within the DAM system, which opens up a whole new world of complexities. But by focusing throughout on aligning these four pillars of digital asset management, uh, we're confident that when our two-year report to our donor and our executives comes along, we will be able to demonstrate increased asset usage, enhanced system integrations, increased user satisfaction, and streamlined workflows across the organization. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much. Kim, thanks very much for, for this great presentation, such a thoughtful construct. I really like how in our conversations and how today you wove in a lot of interest that drove your academic work as well as the, uh, and then finding how that unfolded in the digital asset management world. We had a question come in when you, when your volunteers are helping you with the facial recognition process, do you have a um, kind of a parking lot where their work goes and then it's reviewed by the professional staff? Yes, we review it, um, and we have uh, we have very fine grained user user management as well in, in the system. So we're able to essentially create accounts that can only edit face recognition information. Um, so yeah, we have uh, a lot of control over the processes, but we find that I mean they do a really great job. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's such an it's so easy to sometimes forget to ask, um, but there are some. Just terrific stories. Another one that matches yours or is, stands in tandem with yours is down at the uh, Mariners Park and Museum in Newport News, Virginia, which had a backlog of it's over I think over three hundred thousand images. Wow! That part of the United States is the main na naval uh, basis for America, and has of course an extraordinary community of people who believe in service, and their volunteers have gone through that entire backlog. And they set up kind of a free parking zone where their work is checked and whatnot, but it was what a remarkable impact it has. And it builds community engagement, belief, and becomes one of those measures that goes into the board report about backlog going away, which is really nice. I do like also how you tied the various steps along the way into achieving the mission and the mandate of TIFF. I think sometimes we forget to do that in the not-for-profit cultural heritage sector 
as well as in the corporate sector, that we are working in service of larger goals and framing what we do, even if it's that everyday stuff, really, really helps. And it makes a mark when we're trying to give the mark of measurement on what we're doing. We had another question come in. Uh, does TIF leverage or is thinking about any forensic watermarking technologies as a part of DAM to protect the assets from potential leaks and being, being able to trace back inappropriate usage? We, we, have, we have not really approached that, uh, though we're aware of that possibility. Um, I mean, primarily so far, the, the sort of risk management tools we've applied have been audit trails and things like that in, in sort of a lower tech fashion, but, but that's certainly something we would consider in the future. Yeah, and I, I liked your phrasing of approaching AI with both interest and suspicion. Uh, it's it's fun to think of all the things that AI can stand for, from um, assumed inanity to a whole bunch of other things that are, are kind of clever and fun to think about. And related to that, we had a, a, a question come in. Have you used any of the AI image recognition uh, utility to date for image deduplication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our deduplication was sort of a, a built-in built-in tool of our, of our dam from the vendor. Um, so I, I don't have too much detail on the exact processes. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we had come in, and we do have both the Q&A as well as the chat. So if you want to stick your questions in the Q&A, it's a little easier for Reem and I to keep track of them. Do you utilize master non-compressed file formats for your huge amounts of video and image assets at ingestion? Good question. Mm, great question, yeah. So for images, um, we certainly use the master formats. Um, we do have some very large TIFFs, but um, mm -hmm. the, they're small enough that it's worth keeping the originals. For video content, we're only just approaching that, but we're, we're definitely going to be generating proxies for a lot of our content because it just wouldn't be feasible otherwise. Yeah. And I think as dams have ever more capability for dynamic outbound transformation, where some dams can actually read the destination and do the correct file compression or image alteration to conform to that, it's quite valuable. So Tim, one of the uh, very nice things that you have shared with the, with LED and for our gathered community today are, are some gifts from TIFF. And I'm going to ask Reem to have our first non-door prize awarding. Thank you, David. So Tef is actually gave us two giveaways. So I am going to announce two names that actually won the two giveaways from Tef. Our first winner is Winnie Zan. So Winnie, uh, congratulations. I will be reaching out to you for more information about uh, the giveaways. And our second winner is uh, Abdullah Khatib. So Abdullah and Winnie, congratulations. You won uh, two giveaways uh, from uh, TEF. Thank you also, uh, Tim, for the opportunity. Yes, Thank you very much. And they're pretty fun. What all did they include, either Tim or Reem? I was trying to remember. Oh, a lot of stuff. Three <laughs> <laughs> uh, tickets to our year. A lot of year our year round programming and uh, uh, priority tickets for festival and a lot of other perks as well. Great. And thanks for your generosity, both in that and especially sharing about your journey and your career and what's led you to be contributing to the field of digital asset management today. I think that the way you broke down the four stages and and their their subsequent impacts is uh, commendable. I know Reem will be turning to you to teach that in one of her classes. So get ready. <laughs> And yes, well, yes. I'm looking forward to, I mean, it's been great, great working with you folks. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. We appreciate your participation and the time you devoted to this. So speaking of Reem and speaking of the uh, the LED, Reem, I think is, this is a point where I do turn this over to you. Yes. So uh, we are actually going to show uh, the first brief but the spectacular. What we're going to show today. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are uh, I'm teaching an undergraduate course uh, in digital asset management, and it's a very unique uh, course. I have an average of 140 students taking this course every day, learning everything about asset, asset management. We have a creative assignment called the DAM Creative, where students select a topic, and then they have to re-represent it 
in a creative uh, in a creative way. I am going to post on the uh, chat a link to our showcase. Out of 140 submission, we selected our a top candidate for uh, the DAM uh, Creative Award. And uh, we have two different video where students are going to share uh, their uh, submission and experience. And we will announce the winner uh, later uh, today. So I'm happy to share with you the first video uh, where the first five student uh, DAM uh, Creative. I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed. My name is Jasmine and this past year I've had the great opportunity to take the digital asset management course. What I really liked about this course was the hands-on experience we got throughout the semester. We weren't talking about building a dam, we were actually building it. And I think that's what made this course so memorable of all the classes I've taken in university. I like the dam creative project specifically because it gave me a chance to explore this question I genuinely had about how exactly Google serves us what we need to see. I had heard the term SEO before search engine optimization, but I knew there had to be more than just finding a few keywords. I had no idea that factors like website load time and proper copyright also affected the search results, and that all these factors can be easily controlled through good digital asset management, like ensuring proper file sizes and usage rights are maintained. So finally, I packed up all this information I learned into an infographic fittingly themed like the Google search page to really tie the whole topic together. Hey, my name is Jessica and I got the amazing opportunity to take part in the digital asset management course as part of my academic program. Now, when we think about a company's growing capacity to manage their high volumes of data and digital assets, we tend to think about this large database where everything is stored up, kind of like in the modern library. But this wasn't just the value I got from this course. Instead, I learned that the digital asset management system is much more intricate. Just like how every piece of book in the library isn't just randomly shelved, but they are carefully cataloged with detailed notes, usage rights, and is placed in the grand scheme of things, the root of the DAN system has a strong emphasis on the use of many structured items, like metadata, usage rights and permissions, version control, and much more to maintain consistency and centralization. As a result, I created an infographic on the best practices in dam planning that will serve as a blueprint of the first steps to create a sense of organization within this chaotic digital environment. Taking GCM 460 as part of my undergraduate education has really opened my eyes to the ways any sized organization can store their assets based on their needs. After completing this course, I can confidently say that I've gained very valuable insight into the logistics of DAM and use it in my workplace today. By creating this infographic, I was able to reflect on the different aspects of digital asset management and was able to visualize a whole picture of complex parts for an innovative system. Being a visual learner, this infographic helped me visualize DAM and the role of AI within and break it down into easily digestible information. I'm very grateful for this course and assignment and for the knowledge I've gained from it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Samantha Villamore, and I had the honor of learning about digital asset management under Reem this year. As someone who loves content creation, learning about dance was integral to my success in the graphic arts industry. However, beyond simple lectures, I had the opportunity to create, manage, and troubleshoot a dam with my peers. This helped me understand the workflow and how to ensure longevity with the industry's changing needs paired with what a company may face while using one. What really appealed to me while managing a dam was governance, how to make a dam consistent with the company's goals, in addition to ease of use, security, and searchability while delegating access and responsibilities. So, for our dam creative project, I decided to learn more about what is involved in creating a governance plan, such as when to employ it, what to include, the four pillars, and how to build and maintain it. I hope you enjoy my findings as much as I enjoyed researching them. Thank you. My biggest takeaway from digital asset management is that it's made by humans for humans. From categories to tagging to security to expiry of assets, it makes projects go smoothly and campaigns have the proper copyrights to go through. Product information management highlights that human connection even further, from the origins to the endpoint, from making the product to capture and all the information acquired for the customer. 
my video highlights these features with several case studies and the benefits of introducing PIM alongside DAM. And that uh, concludes the uh, video. We will have another video later on and we will announce the uh, winners later on. Over to you, David. And if anybody thinks it's easy to pick the best, <laughs> just watch oh, all no. the <laughs> It's really not. <laughs> um, I do want to say also that in the Teaching of Reams class, we ask digital asset managers from all over the world to join us both as mentors and as judges when the final projects have all been turned in, bearing in mind that these undergraduates are completing, creating a dam, creating a company with the thesis of how dam will affirm brand or operations of that company. So uh, Reem, Reem and I, and but especially Reem, are never shy about asking. We do hope some of you have joined us today. We'll consider volunteering your time. It's not that much, and it's a lot of fun and quite impactful to help mentor and guide the future professionals in our field. At the same time, there's another interesting implication of what's going on at LED, which along with educating an inbound class of digitally of accelerated digital literacy in DAM, a class of employees and opportunity for employees. We also have the world's first university center where research on digital asset management can be centered. This is something I've long dreamed about and have been aware of how much great information is out there from vendors, from conferences with nowhere to go. At Toronto Metropolitan University, with the Lab for Excellence in DAM, we now have an opportunity to institutionalize knowledge and to nurture research on what digital asset management means, means in many, many ways. I've had the great pleasure of meeting one of Reem's colleagues, and now I get to introduce her to you. Cheryl, over to you, and thanks so much for all the work you've done to get ready for today and your contributions. Okay, thank you so much, David. I'm assuming my volume is a okay. I'm um, just okay. gonna. <laughs> I'm dating myself with that reference, but it's all good. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I am gonna spare time and not give a lengthy introduction of myself. Um, I'm also gonna minimize my little box so I don't spend time staring at myself. Let's admit that's what we do. <laughs> and I want to just introduce my project because uh, my work is, a, I guess, a little bit of a, a left field from the earlier presentations, which I've learned so much from. And I just want to say, if I'm speaking at a pace that seems a bit fast, I encourage everyone to use the captions so that you're, you're following along as I talk. So I'm here to present MOBA. Thank you, David, for the comment earlier this morning to ensure that I explain the acronym. So the long name of that is Mapping Ontario's Black Archives, Building an Inventory Through Storytelling. And I'm just going to take you through what this project is. And um, really, someone said this to me recently, that it, it kind of can be a template to be replicated around the world. So MOBA is the first to really be doing what we're doing in terms of Black cultural preservation and Black history preservation. So this project started as a five-year um, project funded through what's called an Early Ontario Researcher Award. So that is an award that is giving out, given out through the province of Ontario. And it's really award that funds infrastructure projects. So MOBA, I think, is probably one of the first digital infrastructure projects to ever receive an Early Ontario Researcher Award. And so I didn't know that at the beginning of the project. And so what is the project? First of all, many of you who've ever gone into a traditional archive, if you've seen the storage at the archive, this is kind of what it looks like. They have shelves with uh, digital, uh, digital files. They have shelves with files, with film, reels, um, just to follow up the TIFF presentation, uh, with old books. And you pretty much go through, even if they have a website, you go onto their website, you, you, you look for the things that you want. And then the idea of the archive as it has existed for centuries is that you go in 
you go in, you maybe you've already told them what items you want to look at, and they provide you with the items and you look at the items. Now, I am not suggesting in this presentation that we stop that idea of going into the physical archive. What this presentation is really trying to say is that it is time for the archive to realize that there needs to be two experiences of archival materials. There's the physical archive where you go in and you do your thing. And then there needs to be a digital experience of the archive. And that's where the dam really plays into the work that MOBA is doing. And so why this project? <laughs> why Mapping Ontario's Black Archives? Well, I've been a researcher now for like 15 years. And if anyone knows anything about Black history, and I don't think this is unique to Canada, I feel like this is a global issue. Anywhere where there's colonialism, there's Black history. And where there's colonial, col colonialism and Black history, there's hidden archives. There's hidden stories. There's communities that have been erased. There are people who are overlooked. There's a, a version of history that doesn't match up with the storytelling that we have in Black communities. And so all my life, really, I've been grappling with this gap of, well, how can we know this information? But when I go into ins institutions to find it, it's like I can never find it, especially navigating websites. So if I go on a digital, if I go on an archives webpage and I try to find Black history, often it's such a challenge that I have to physically go in and the, the archivist will tell me, yeah, I know the website was horrible. So they will even admit <laughs> that their digital footprint doesn't really help you. And so my mindset was, we need to fix the, the gaps and erasures. We need to do something with this. You go into a textbook and most of the information doesn't even relate to black people. And because that's the textbook world, what the digital world allows you to do is to make connections that the analog world still can't make. So here you have a screen showing you a lot of discrete textbooks. As we know, a dam system completely blows up that idea of knowledge as being discreetly housed within a package and says it's time to make connections and to bring all of this knowledge together. And that's really what MOBA is trying to do. So here's the life cycle of the project. In 2021, too, we began the project by saying, we first, we need to know where are all the Black um, archives in the province? So we needed to understand the, the, the actual physical collections. Where are they? We started doing some public engagement. We gave a talk at a few archives. Then we, we wanted to establish what was missing in the record. And what we found was that in the province of Ontario, there are 5,400 records that you can access digitally. These records are housed at 94 archives. So if you know the province of Ontario, this is from Windsor right up to Thunder Bay there are black collections, specifically 5,400 records. The next thing is 22-23, we did a survey. We went out and we wanted to especially speak to the creative community because one of the things that this project has said from the beginning is that archives also haven't considered a diverse archetype of research. So they tend to think the only person going in there is a student or an academic researcher. And what this project has said is that you're missing an entire demographic from the dancer to the artist, the visual artist, the filmmaker, um, the, the, the public historian who's looking to know more about their community. So we wanted to understand that. So we did a survey of all of those people. We migrated that into a geospatial map. If you go to mobaprojects.ca, I'm gonna take you there in a second. You will see the work that we did in building out this essentially content management system. Cause it's right now MOBA is a CMS system. That's really what it is. We've then expanded in 2023, 24, and we built a prototype dam that basically said, okay, MOBA on the one hand has mapped all of these collections around the province, but in mapping all of those collections and doing the work that I do, I've also collected physical materials over the years that I realized I should be turning MOBA into an archive. And if MOBA is gonna become an archive, it needs to be a dam archive. 
that we can continue the work of building the storytelling around. So we did that this year. Next year, the real plan is to continue to build out the dam and to create MOBA archive that is searchable, that is really reflecting the Black creative community, especially. So we're in the process of, of doing a lot of that work to essentially be able to receive physical assets that we then convert into digital assets. And we've been working um, with a dam vendor that I will not mention um, to really build this because part of what MOBA is trying to do in, when we get to year five is to put all this together, is to say Black history doesn't just belong in discrete textbooks. There's an opportunity here through the digital technology to create interconnected storytelling, cultural preservation, and a unique way of presenting materials that really, I don't think the industry has ever really seen before. And when we do get the dam up and running, it's not going to be fully free <laughs> because we have to fund ourselves. So there will be a pay for use feature depending on the level of access that people want because I'm looking at this as a way to intervene in a gap in an industry that has literally been built on the colonial logic of we house all the information and you as subject have to come in and access us. MOBA is saying, no, you don't. I think we can create a world where people donate their assets. We turn them into digital files. We give you back the assets. And now your assets can be in conversation with black community. So we get out of the discreteness of information that is currently the way archives are um, hold information. And so, Here's the survey, little thing of who we spoke to. Well, this is a stock image, also royalty free. <laughs> um, and here's the province. And you should know, when we did our survey, what was so interesting is how often people are engaging with Black collections in the province. 6% of the people we surveyed said daily. 30% said weekly. 21% monthly, 27 quarterly, and 12 yearly. So what the project also revealed is that we tapped into a user base that I didn't even know existed, right? Because again, the collections are so discreet that you have no way of knowing who's using what and where because there is no system that brings that all together. And so here is <laughs> my little mock-up of the actual website. Please, I wanna encourage you to go to mobaprojects.ca and you can see the work that's already been done. And this is, work that is ongoing. And what is that work? It is the work to make the first part of that project, the CMS site, completely accessible through a geospatial map. So you can go to mobaprojects.ca and you will see the eventually the 94 archives. And when you click on one of the archives, it will show you all the collections. And then you will be able to see in that clicking what collections are connected to other collections in the province. So it will essentially bring them into communication with each other, which again is something that the industry has just not done in the hundred plus years that they've been around. And so what's next? I know burning question, what is next? Well, the plan is to continue to build the dam. We, you know, and that's where working with LED and, and, and Reem has been such an amazing journey in MOBA's um, life cycle because it's really helped me to understand how important it is to have a dam system to continue the work of what we're doing in the digital space. That if I'm gonna create digital storytelling, that the dam is the future. <laughs> you know, that is the, the, the portal to do that kind of storytelling. And it takes history out of this really static, unevolving, analog world that has been the world, essentially. And I think one of the exciting things about the project is that we're trying to say history can be fun when you bring it into conversation with other histories, as opposed to the, the traditional way that history is managed as being very discreet. And also, if any of you have ever worked in archives, there's always this sense of having to depend on the institution of the archive as the knowledge holder. So they act in a way as not just, um, um, you know, people who are holding the assets or they're somehow stewards of the assets. They almost act like they know more than you. 
MOBA is trying to democratize that knowledge transfer of saying, we don't know more than you. We want to understand you. And we want you to be in communication with other people who have had your experiences in life. That's really what MOBA is. So the five years are ticking away. Here's that old fashioned clock that I love so much. I can't believe the project is really heading into its fourth year. But what we really plan to do is after we do build the dam, we finish the CMS, the real plan is to do both a physical exhibition, but also a virtual exhibition that will almost be like um, experiencing MOBA as a as a, vi a, a digital game. <laughs> That's the plan to create two experiences because part of what my project has really become is understanding that in the 21st century, research has to appreciate that there's an, a digital world and the physical world that you live in. And our goal is not to create a digital world to just drive people to the physical world, right? The goal is to understand that these are separate worlds. And that a digital experience can be just as engaging, just as impactful, interconnected as a physical experience, especially when it comes to history. So here's where you can reach me. Here's my personal website. If you want to, who is Dr. Cheryl Thompson? She didn't introduce herself. Um, you can look me up on my website. By the way, Black Creative Lab is sort of the project through Toronto Metropolitan University that is really funding all of this. So Black Creative Lab is like the umbrella and MOBA is the, the biggest project through Black Creative Lab that is really trying to, if I could just sum it up, I can't believe I got this done in time, um, to really revolutionize the way we think about history and also the way we think about the present. So thank you very much. Cheryl, that was excellent. And we gave you another hour. Didn't anybody tell you? So <laughs> no, no, you did not. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> they're so it's so fascinating to hear a professional who's at the helm of changing the meaning of archive from kind of dusty shelves, from what I call box and shelf thinking, that basically it was we've been doing since 1500 something. Yep. To the idea of self-discovery, of heuristic interrogation. I'm reminded so much of your the importance of your work by what's happened with the Studs Terkel archive in Chicago, where when he passed away and he donated all of his interviews, they all have to be rights checked. But all of his interviews can be interrogated. It was first aimed at teachers to go through and say, okay, Here's these amazing interviews that Stunt Turkle did. I want to know Black authors, Chicago, who were writing, who were journalists, or Alice Walker, whatever the case might be. And then one can look for themes. And it's that idea of taking something that could rest in stasis, rest yes. in an accessibility, and have it become present. And in that case, injected right into the school system in Chicago, where kids could get a hold of it and teachers could use it. Yes, exactly. I think what you are directing here and contributing to where we're seeing not there's a physical exhibition here and a digital thing over there I can look up, but intertwining those two is so rich with potential. Um, and I look forward to being one of the visitors to that exhibition yes. as soon as <laughs> I possibly can. Awesome. And I do, I do think we all take note about how digital asset management can underwrite or, or under can support and become foundational to the use and expression of such an important project like this. Have there been any, uh, what are a couple of assets, um, archives, discoveries that you've made along the way that just made you sit in your chair and be a little surprised? Oh, I mean, there's so much, but I think um, one of the one of the persons that we've been working with is a is a legendary Canadian jazz dancer named Joey Hollingsworth, and Joey Hollingsworth was pretty much forgotten. Okay, like nobody remembered Joey Hollingsworth. Just mm -hmm. to this day, people don't know he was on the Ed Sullivan Show. He performed across Canada internationally. This person danced for fifty years, and then he was 
forgotten. And so Joey Hollingsworth, through a, a various relationships, has donated a lot of personal photographs to the MOBA Dam. When the MOBA Dam launches, the Joey mm -hmm. Hollingsworth collection will really be one of the first collections. And in that collection, he also has personal letters that he wrote to famous celebrities that he's donated to us. And he has a record of some of the shows that he did. And mm -hmm. the reason why it, it matters is because but for what I'm offering Joey Hollingsworth, a yeah. traditional archive would ask, who is Joey Hollingsworth? <laughs> Why do we want this work? Because they never heard of him. Mm -hmm. So right. I'm trying to say, and I think this is the case across anywhere there's Black collections, that the, the people that Black community know are important, often mm -hmm. the institution doesn't see as important enough. Mm -hmm. Like they have a hierarchy of who they want to bring in. MOBA's not trying to do that. In fact, we're actually, the most interesting assets to answer your question more succinctly is anyone, anyone who's been alive for 80 years, you have a story. And that's really what MOBA is trying to reach out to anyone who has a story that really would be precluded from the traditional institution. I think, and it will be quite interesting to see the ways in which I'm going to use the word consumers, users, consumers, producers, et cetera, who, when they can use the, use MOBA, how the navigational routes they take and if there'll be yeah. some to map that, it'll be fascinating to yeah, watch that. For sure. So we had a question come in. Is the dam going to be cloud-based where cl cloud-based architecture? Yes. Yes, it will be. I can't say too much on it um, because of who I'm working mm -hmm. with, but yes, it will be. And it will also be, like I said, there'll be sort of a tiered level of use because I also mm -hmm. believe in accessibility. Right. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, especially if you're a student, you can't afford maybe to pay for a year subscription. So maybe mm -hmm. portions of the dam will be accessible. But as you know, if you want to keep something that you're working on as a sole person running, you do need to have a revenue stream of some kind to support the work. And there'll be so many pathways to discovery that this is enabling. Um, next year, when we do Dam for Canada, comma, version five, um, I'm I think Reem and I are going to be ready for a demo. So get ready. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Great. Thanks. Cheryl, thanks so much for the time you put into distilling this extraordinary project that you're working on. And I will look forward to both contributing to it and learning more and more about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Our next presentation gives us the opportunity to see a bit of the dialogue that goes. It's very common where DAM serves on one hand, a brand and an agency and agency operations. And on the other hand, DAM serves, DAM has to operate within the within the company that's paying an agency to do something. We're fortunate today to have Julie with us to speak to this issue and to the complexities of DAM in two different worlds. Julie, it's been so nice working with you getting ready for today and we're going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, David. First of all, thank you, TMU, for having me here in the 4th um, Canada um, for DAM. And I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, you're not quite in presentation mode yet. Oh, yeah, I'm going to click play. Okay. Cool. Okay, let's get started. So um, as David mentioned, I'm Julie Ye. I'm currently a senior digital asset manager at Critical Mass, which is like an all digital creative um, advertising agency in Canada. And this is kind of like the agenda I have set up for today. I'll briefly talk about my career journey and how I all got started. And I'm moving on to my two career experiences at an agency and for brands. And lastly, I will kind of comment on the future roadmap of the dam based on my industry experience and open the floor for some Q and A. So if you have any questions, if at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. So shall we begin? This is my career journey and how it all started. So I had a very interesting career journey, how digital asset management fell into my hands. It all started in 2018, where 
the role of digital asset management job title was just so unheard of. And nor were there programs such as the Recruiter Dam Certification Program and currently the LED program at TMU existed. It was just such an unfamiliar terrain and quite an unusual path to really um, pursue because it was non-existent. Um, but I saw the potential in this industry. The world is becoming more, if not all, digitalized. In 2024, 328 million terabytes of content is being generated each day. That is a lot of content being produced. So my intuition back then told me that in the coming years, there'll definitely be a demand for this expertise in digital asset management. So in 2018, when a digital asset coordinator um, opportunity came along in a YouTube's right management startup, I decided to say yes. <laughs> so then I um, quickly fell in love with this role and I really enjoyed the day-to-day -day task of organizing large quantities of video assets and also organizing the metadata and taxonomy and um, the content usage rights and the copyright infringement in the YouTube CMS um, system. So from there, I decided I want to really pursue this career as I'm very passionate about it since I had a taste of it. So I decided to work for an ad agency, Bensu One, and servicing our client Honda and, um, and Acura, and moved on to um, working for our national brand, Canadian Tire Corporation. Then um, I went back to work for an advertising agency called Critical Mass Servicing AT&T and various other clients. Um, during my career trajectory, I got exposed to implementing various DAM products and DAM solutions from start to finish sometimes across different types of industry. It goes to show that Asset management really lives in different types of industry, from automotive to telecommunication to even um, accounting SaaS softwares um, and retail suppliers. And what really satisfied me the most is seeing the outcome of the benefits and the efficiency gain when implementing a DAM system successfully for um, cross-functional team to utilize. Now I want to reflect on my um, two sides of the career experience working for an agency and for a brand and what it means to operationalize them for an agency and a brand and how will we manage all the content that is being produced. So to put everyone in perspective, um, from 2007, 99.9% um, .9 of the information generated is in digital format. So that means in the contrary, there is 0.1% of the information generated that is still um, on um, paper in more static formats. So that is, and think about the way that there are so many um, content now and it's all digitalized and more and more and more content is only going to be produced at an even faster rate with all the emerging new um, tech and design tools we get great with. And even in the coming years, there have been a rise of new media platforms emerging such as TikTok and these new media platforms need to be filled with content. And even think about the ways that we could produce um, content at scale. Um, and with interjection of AI generated content, you could write a prompt and multiple different variations of content could be just produced on demand for you. And think about the capabilities of um, 3D rendering um, of imagery at scale with a 3D master file, you could already just export different types and variants of um, assets very quickly. So I would say both um, agencies Global and national brands need asset management service more than ever to organize, to store, to localize, to distribute, and even protect the, all the content. And let's dive kind of deeper into what it means to use DAM systems for an agency. So for an agency, you're on the service side of helping clients manage 
all their marketing collaterals usually produce with in-house agency or with collaboration with partners agencies. And they really, agencies tend to use the dam to accelerate um, asset production in the pipeline. And agencies tend to use it to also organize and store all the client approved latest version finalized uh, assets. So teams can search, track, and even reuse um, some of the assets for their future campaign. And also effectively manage digital rights usage because we want to ensure we're not using all the ex any expired content or unlicensed content or even assets that are not authorized to be used in certain territories or media terms. And now that's kind of um, brushed through what it means for brands to utilize DAM systems. So for brands, it means um, it's more of a collaboration tool used within the in-house cross-functional teams. Um, so power users like the marketing people, the product team or the e-commerce team, they tend to use the DAM to really centralize and distribute their brand assets to ensure these assets are compliant to brand consistency, adhering to the brand guidelines and the metadata standard that is um, established. And I'm gonna keep emphasizing the importance of this, but the um, the management of usage rights compliance, it's quite an important piece because you know for brands, you really wanna mitigate that risk of using any unlicensed or unauthorized um, assets in market. Um, so what does the future roadmap of the dam look like. Um, I want to first start by sharing that I'm really grateful um, of my um, progression on my career journey and I do see myself continuing to grow in the digital asset management space and in the coming years what I envision the roadmap of dam to be like based on again my industry experience over the past six years is three key points. So leveraging AI is going to become more prominent. AI is going to become more advanced and precise. Integration is going to be at core of DAM working with other systems. And DAM will be pivotal um, for organizations to use um, for enhancing collaboration across different teams. And let me uh, kind of elaborate on all these three points. So leveraging AI to improve relevancy of asset discoverability. So in the coming years, um, AI decision-making and AI algorithm only become more precise and accurate. If you think about the 328 million terabytes of content that is being produced, AI could now take all these content and data and learn from the data patterns and predict a more um, relevant and um, accurate um, recommendation for you. And leveraging AI would also reduce time and effort on the manual management. So AI can really help us in refining the more complex automated workflows within an organization. And on contrary, um, AI could also assist in um, automating the basic, um, easy, repetitive tasks such as metadata tagging at scale. And with the current modern dam um, systems um, that we have in market, there's already been a lot of um, auto tagging features that you know AI could uh, really um, assist in tagging products by color, even season. I've seen auto tagging being able to tag um, facial um, emotions and tag the scenery or even the object itself. Um, and leveraging AI um, really could help assist discovering insights about the content within your dam. Now that everything is stored within your dam, you can now see how your assets are performing and um, what kind of users are searching um, certain assets within your dam system to make better recommendation or personalization for each end users within the dam while searching. And integration, like I said, is gonna be core of connecting all the design systems and the tools that your organization is used using, sorry, to create with, to create that very omni-channel experience. So as a result, it could drive a really seamless digital experience for the end users. Um, imagine a world where systems are all connected, unified, and um, information are being updated in real time. That's kind of what DAM is achieving. And in a push of a button, these contents or data can transfer from one environment to another seamlessly. And collaboration, so 
Using the DAM will be pivotal for cross-functional teams to collaborate effectively and self-sufficiently. Um, the nature of remote work, and even think about within your organization, there are some team members who work in different time zones or different countries altogether. So DAM really could serve as an ongoing collaboration tool to really satisfy all the cross-functional teams needs as now they have like a centralized like hub where and this hub has like all the assets that is the one source of truth in the master files so teams can now collaborate more effectively and efficiently um, we don't have to go back to the days where someone's searching for an asset you have to you know go back to your email from three months ago where is that asset it's now all centralized here and uh, my final comment on the future of dam is that Digital asset management as a career is very promising, and I feel like the DAM space is only getting um, started and will uh, keep evolving as techno technology keeps evolving. Um, when I first began my career journey, I really never thought that I would be speaking here today of such a, a job title that's unheard of. Um, which is now growing in demand. And my advice to everyone here today is, and this also applies to life, that be curious and trust your intuition. It was my curiosity and my intuition six years ago that led me down this path. And it is a promising career to pursue. And even within the damn ecosystem, it's very niche. If you want to specialize in, one, uh, in a role such as you know, you want to be expert in API integration, integrating all the systems to your DAM system, or if you're more interested in the number aspect of it, you know, could also specialize in understanding um, asset analytics. And my personal favorite is to be really specialized in the admin level of um, implementing the DAM system, the day-to-day -day of use, using the DAM system. And... To end a note, pretty prestigious brands want it and agencies are asking for it. So I'm very excited to see where the future of digital asset management is headed. And I hope I'm right there with you if you choose to pursue this career. Thank you. Julie, thank you so much. And, and I do think we know the answer to that is yes, you'll be there. Uh, Dan has so many career paths available. And I'll comment on these from two levels, and we have a couple of questions. One is that the skill sets that you reflect in your work on the agency side and on the direct on the working at a brand side, there are so there are also roles with damn vendors who need non-technical professionals to help in everything. It might sound silly from advanced sales engineering and presentations all the way through to managing customer success and implementation technical assistance and training. And it's very difficult to go for vendors to find professionals in, the role, in those roles who do who have success, who have not worked in a damn role. And all of us can be aware that from there are three great entry points into this career, directly working on DAM, working in a consultant, consultative role, which is not for everybody, and then working for vendors, which some people have a stereotype about that I, if anything I can do to help dissuade that I want to. Many of the dam vendors are the smartest people on the planet in dam. They spend millions of dollars, millions of dollars working on this complex and ever-growing software and have really interesting jobs and, and can afford intriguing career opportunities that are generally very well-paid opportunities. One of the facets I wondered if you could comment on from a collaboration point of view and integration point of view is if you could comment on, I'm going to generalize a couple of questions that came in on the content supply chain, on how the dam manager's role is looking both within dam, like everything working okay in here, to looking at the broader content supply chain <clears throat> from its origins and say in a creative brief all the way through to, okay, that was used. Now it goes into a, maybe not an archive, but into storage. So maybe a little bit of a comment if you can on your, uh, <clears throat> on your view of how the supply chain yeah. 
the con the importance of the content. Yeah, for sure. Chain. I think one aspect of it, like when I mentioned integration, if integrated correctly with your dam in, in the production process, for example, you're a designer and you're working within a Photoshop file and you know you're just generating the next campaign. And if um within the Photoshop you sorry, within the dam, you integrated the creative, uh, the Adobe Creative Suite within the Photoshop, you as a designer don't have to really leave um, the PS, I'm sorry, the Photoshop software. And mm -hmm. within there, they could just, you know, pull in the assets from the dam that is like the most latest accurate uh, version of it. Mm -hmm. um, so and on the other end, when the creatives are updating the asset, there's like some editing to do. They just ingest the master file and it will replace the older version. But um, simultaneously, the designers are working on, you know, the Photoshop file to create the, the campaigns. And they're able to just, you know, get that information, the most relevant and um, accurate. Um, so I think it works in a way where, you know, designers now could save time by not going into the system anymore. It's integrated within the application itself, and they could even save out their working files back into um, the DAM system. It's always interesting to look at where does work in progress go? Does it stay in a pre-DAM state? Does it go into the DAM? Does it dialogue with DAM? It's no single answer to that, but always interesting. Uh, we did have a question come in asking Julie. And Julie, you can stop sharing your screen if you'd like. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the, we like thank yous. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a question come in asking Julie about which damn systems have the best UIs. And we don't we don't um, ask those questions in our in our sessions and our get togethers. And the, the reason for that is that Julie knows what Julie works on, but there are a whole bunch of other dams that have interesting UIs that she or I, it's very difficult to answer in general like that. I think most everybody on the call welcomes a, a side conversation, but this is why we don't ask, we don't talk about specific vendors or functionality because it just, it ends up in an impossible conversation. We want to know kind of like Tim said, what's the impact of using this? And as Julie just recapped from two different perspectives, Julie, thanks so much. Look forward to hearing your continued career success. Thank you. And Reem, over to you, please. Thank you, David. We are now going to announce the winner of the second giveaway. This giveaway is uh, coming uh, from a Webinabi Mabel setup, and yum yummy Mabel setup. And our winner is uh, Farah Al Jirjawi. So Farah, congratulations. We will be in touch with you uh, to uh, uh, discuss how you're going to receive that. And David. Uh, I think we are uh, outlined for a break now. I think so. It, it, I think it's also important to mention that the various, we every year when we have our giveaways, we work with Indigenous Canadian companies so, and businesses all the way from PEI to Vancouver Island. And Wabanaki Maple Syrup, if you go to their website, it's pretty fun to see their origins and their story. It's so yummy. Yeah, and really tasty. <laughs> So, although I can't get it in the United States. So <laughs> we do have a break now. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes at 10 of 2 at 150150. Thank you everyone for your attention. See you shortly. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good break. I was trying to see what can I do in 10 minutes to have me be all ready. Um, our next presentation is entitled The Enterprise Semantic Layer, Metadata and Taxonomy at Scale for Transformation. We have the chance to have my friend and colleague, Stephanie Lemieux, join us for this important topic. She is who I call when I have those very questions. And it's always a real treat for all of us when we're in the same city that Stephanie is in and her colleagues, because they have so much to share about the role of taxonomy at scale and how to put something that can be so complex into thoughtfully evaluated work. Stephanie, your thoughts always give me good guidance. Thank you for taking the time to share a few today. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me share my screen. So I'm going to be a little bit, sorry, go ahead, David. Uh, this is going to be a slightly different uh, fork in the road, I suppose. Uh, I am not a digital asset manager. Uh, however, I work a lot with DAM systems because I'm a metadata and taxonomy specialist. Uh, so I run a small consulting firm and literally all we do all day long is taxonomies and metadata for search, uh, for organizing information across all kinds of different applications, of which DAM is, of course, uh, an important one and one that we work with very often. Uh, and I've done DAM systems for pictures of bracelets, people people in brown shorts delivering packages and for things like international human rights. So I uh, had the pleasure to see DAM implementations in lots of different contexts and at lots of different scales. Uh, so from very small dams for a uh, rock band to a very large global dam for uh, consumer packaged goods companies. And what they really all have in common, though, is that they're just trying to deal with the proliferation of content. And we've been talking about the proliferation of content already a few times uh, in this symposium, and we've been talking about it really since the internet started. So, you know, what's new? Well, what's new is we have AI gener generated content now. So people are throwing things into chat GPT or Copilot or whatever and creating AI generated text and images. So the proliferation is not going to end anytime soon. Uh, and what also is not ending anytime soon is the challenge of organizing all of that stuff, giving it structure, making it findable and usable. And we are quickly finding ourselves, no matter what system we try to put together, it, content grows so fast, so exponentially that we can eventually no longer see out the window. So. Uh, you know, since the beginning of this content problem, we have been trying to throw systems at it. So, you know, we started out years and years ago with, okay, well, let's just put everything in a shared folder. Uh, okay, well, actually, no, let's get a real system to put things in. Oh, actually, let's get SharePoint. Oh, everyone loves SharePoint. Oh, let's get four SharePoints. And then, oh, okay, actually, no, we need things that are a little bit more specialized than SharePoint. So let's get a Salesforce and let's get a DAM and let's get a CMS. And actually, no, we need a different DAM because we're special. Let's put our things in what we'll call a marketing library, but it's really a DAM. And, you know, it's so on and so forth uh, across the entire organization. There are systems being spooled up every five minutes, it feels, to try to solve the content problem. 
Uh, so this is kind of what an enterprise's uh, periodic table of systems might look like. And this is actually, uh, I have a client that I'm working with right now who literally gave me something like this to show me this is the vast variety of systems. So each block is a system that we have set up at the organization. Uh, DAM is one tiny little box inside this huge enterprise landscape. And we are concerned not only about findability and structure and uh, reuse and metrics within our dam, but we're also concerned about it from the entire creative operations point of view. But creative operations ties up with marketing and communications, and all of that ties into finance, and all of that ties into distribution and legal. So we have to really start thinking about it from an enterprise-wide perspective. At the same time as we are thinking about organizing content, we're also moving into this digital transformation uh, space. And, uh, many organizations have been thinking about digital transformation for years, uh, if not a decade or more, thinking about all of these legacy systems that they've been spooling up since the shared drive over time, and thinking about how can we start making some of these systems talk to each other, modernize them, uh, and create a more um, purposeful architecture across all of this. So digital transformation is very much on the minds of most uh, strategists, most uh, IT managers uh, at, in general. And at the same time, as we're sort of partway through this digital transformation mindset, AI has come and blasted itself all over it and saying, ah, forget digital transformation, forget having to upgrade all of your systems. You can just throw a layer of AI on top of it and AI will magically make everything talk together and make your content flow seamlessly from all these old applications. So what does that mean for us as DAM practitioners who are working in organizations who are just trying to implement a DAM? or trying to, to create a practice around DAM. The one thing that I would want you to take away from this talk is to start pushing against this traditional old school way of thinking about content and architecture. And metadata and taxonomy is part of content architecture. So if you're in an organization and okay, it's time to get a DAM or it's time to upgrade our DAM, the classic way of thinking is like, okay, well, let's focus on implementing a dam. Let's look at what this experience is for the users who are gonna be using the dam. Let's look at the content that's gonna go in this dam. Let's look at the use cases for the dam and the stakeholders and the processes that are specific to the dam. So really kind of taking a relatively siloed approach and thinking about it from a platform perspective or from a single use case perspective. That mindset has to change, especially in this context now of digital transformation and AI takeover. We need to be more strategic about things. Uh, more and more as I'm doing these projects, uh, stakeholders who are working with us are telling us, we don't wanna think just about the dam. We wanna have a much better understanding of what we are doing as an organization. How does what we do in the dam and the content that we create uh, perform out in the wild? How can we better use the assets that we are spending money on uh, and using them in a more effective way, multi-channel? How can we find things not only in the dam but across all of our different applications? How can the dam talk to other applications that are part of the creative operations uh, landscape or process? How can we pull insight from what works and what doesn't work and feed that back into our content creation process? And then finally, how can we automate all these things in, in a more nimble way? And part of the answer to that is, again, rather than thinking about infrastructure and things like taxonomy and metadata from a siloed application uh, specific lens, we need to start thinking about it from a common layer that sits across multiple applications. And this is often referred to as a common semantic layer. So this common semantic layer, and if you're at all interested in this topic, I highly recommend this article written by another wonderful consulting firm uh, that works also, also in the very same space, that semantic layer is this thing that includes taxonomy and metadata that sits 
across multiple sources of content and across multiple applications. And it's really involved in creating shared context, shared definitions, shared structure, standardization, alignment, all of these beautiful, wonderful uh, terms that are helping organizations understand the content that they create, organize it in a way that makes sense to people, do more with it, send it to more places, use it in different ways and measure it. And it kind of looks like this. So if you have a dam, dam is just one application in your spectrum of structured data all the way over to unstructured content. It's living alongside your learning management system, your CMS, your product information management system, your CRM. And the semantic layer is going to be that set of common architecture like taxonomy and metadata, maybe your search also fits in there, that is taking all of that content creating a layer on top of it to say, when we talk about this concept, we use this one way across the entire organization, or we're able to translate across all of these applications and say, these all are talking about the same thing. And thus we can return the right search results, put them all in our standardized reports and understand the value of what we're doing. But also more importantly, we can train an AI to understand those things as well, and not just rely on regular internet language to teach our model what's important to us and to our business and how we talk about it, but to give the AI something more structured and more formal uh, to in which to understand our business. So some of the trends that I'm seeing in DAM projects right now is number one, a lot more focus and investment on this uh, infrastructure layer of semantics. So thinking about Na DAM not as its own standalone system, but really as part of a much larger MarTech ecosystem that is going to rely on this unified semantic layer to be able to move content throughout the creative operations process. And even one layer out of that or one circle out of that is as part of this larger digital transformation across the entire enterprise. So if you're using product hierarchies or brand hierarchies, for example, over in your finance systems, they should all be talking the same language or at least uh, be able to be translated across each other, uh, across the entire enterprise so that DAM can be part of that universe. The other thing is AI. So AI and traditional taxonomy are in this interesting give and take relationship right now. So we're looking at AI to take over some of the boring work of tagging, but also of understanding basic language. We don't necessarily need a taxonomy to tell us anymore that a car and an automobile are the same thing. Uh, the AI can kind of handle that basic level of translation but that the taxonomy and metadata is bringing this foundation of explaining what's important to the business and how the business structures ideas as part of the model to help train AI that lives in this central hub and can help translate user needs and business understandings uh, across everything. And then the last trend uh, that I'm seeing is this very strong focus on reuse creating content that's modular and can be put in multiple finished pieces across lots of different channels. But more importantly, the ability to do analytics on all of that, which requires a structured data approach. So how can we maximize the ROI of what we're creating, again, across that entire creative operations spectrum? And what, uh, how can taxonomy and metadata play a role in uh, making sure that we can understand those insights. So I know a lot of you are students, some of you are practitioners as well. Uh, my message to you is please help be an evangelist for this content. Your dam is not an island. Be an advocate for thinking across the enterprise to not build systems that are disconnected from each other. Uh, that taxonomy and metadata are allies in being able to support enterprise level goals and doing things in a cross-functional way and making sure that we're all speaking the same language. And probably most importantly, AI is not magic. It's not going to solve everything. It will do much better if it has that semantic layer to support it underneath.
Any questions? I know that's a lot. <laughs> and always welcome. Stephanie, thanks so much. I, I'd like to just reinforce a couple of things. One, the importance of understanding that there, there absolutely is an enterprise resource planning background to this, whether it's SAP or Oracle Financials or Awesome, whatever it might be. And part of the next generation that all of us are going to be contributing to in DAM is understanding the cost economics of a digital asset and thereafter the value of a digital asset. It will be, as we will be publishing out of LED when this research is done, quite important to advocating for an economic basis to DAM that accompanies the importance of adjudicating discovery and content production, content legitimacy, which is certainly a sub, a sub theme in Stephanie's presentation. And I think Stephanie will say thanks for you today. Uh, really appreciate that and look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Before we get to our next presentation, Reem and I also want to take a moment to say a big thank you to Lydia, to Acquia, and to Rutgers University, who are our generous sponsors today. Uh, LED is a part of the university, and wow, and we do rely on external funding to help with our research and to help with the program that we do and the ongoing scholarship and other opportunities that we offer. So all participation is welcome. And if any of you work for places that might want to help to underwrite research that where you might be searching for interns, please reach out to Reem and we'll be glad to entertain those conversations. <clears throat> Next up, Adam Brownfield from the West Coast from Destination Canada is going to be joining us to talk about creative operations, digital asset management, where the twain meets and sometimes doesn't. Adam, I've had such a good time working with you on the presentation. Really appreciate your taking some time out of your day today to share with us. Great. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Um, and hopefully I can live up to that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and put this into slideshow mode. And we can all see it. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, yeah, so let's uh, jump, jump in. Um, so part of my goal here is just to provide like a little slice on um, who I am and how I use digital asset management in, um, I don't want to say like real world, uh, but in, in, in practicality, in, in my job uh, and in, in my life. And um, it's funny, I was looking at the various submissions uh, as part of uh, Reem's um, coursework on, on different classes and, and different like sort of approaches and it's interesting to see kind of the theoretical of like, what, what do you do if, if um, or what should you do? What's a good course to follow versus the, oh, I'm in a, I'm in a job and I have limited resources and I have to consider sort of the broader scope of what we do and then how does DAM uh, fit into that space? So really my, uh, my goal is to sort of provide a little bit of like, where does DAM exist in, in a different, uh, in a different uh, enterprise or in a different space. Um, and I think that part of that is like the sort of um, a little bit of like I work in kind of creative production uh, and digital asset management kind of lives within that in that realm. So my background is I started in art school. I dropped out of art school, uh, realizing that um, kind of creativity for me wasn't uh, coming to, to fruition in that space. I then uh, pursued a Bachelor of Arts in art history. Uh, and worked for a while and then ended up going back uh, and doing a master's of information and library sciences, which has really got me into the into the dam realm. Um, so that's a bit of my kind of uh, educational background. But really, I think through all of uh, all of that, um, I have these sort of core interests. I, I still love visual uh, communication. It was art history was really um, pulled me into that. And but I think also it's not just about like, you know, how do you communicate now, but looking at communication over a broader span of time and, and how do ways of seeing and ways of communicating tell us a little bit about who we are now and, and who people were. Um, and then even um, staying back on, on this one, thinking about something like taxonomy as both, uh, um, yeah, a, a system of like organization and structure and 
how can it solve a business need? But if you take a step away from it and look at it, what does it tell you about that business when they do that? Uh, I, I always love that, um, that sort of duality of, of, of that side of it. And I think a large part of, of my job and, and where I work at is, is kind of inhabiting that space. Uh, I work for a corporation that does a lot of marketing uh, globally with tons and tons of partners. Um, and so I'll explain a little bit more of our, our dam build and how that um, plays into there. But um, really kind of act as, and I tried to pull a picture that in, implemented this sort of interface between uh, a lot of people who are saying, hey, we're putting together a marketing campaign to accomplish this, or hey, we need to put together a, a, a sort of a toolkit to help people do this. And then working with the like ad agencies or different kind of creatives to have them um, respond to that uh, and um, sort of facilitating that communication uh, back and forth and, and finding that kind of intersection um, between those things. And then for me, it's always, um, and it goes back to eons ago, uh, I've always been interested in this idea of like form and, and function. Uh, how do the different uh, shape, uh, how do we design things and, and what is that sort of functionality and uh, kind of seeing that as a sort of a dual thread um, between that. So hopefully I'm going to kind of walk through a few things that we've done with our digital asset management platform and uh, bring this out to life. And yeah, I think I've kind of mentioned this, but my my job kind of splits between uh, kind of a product manager, um, managing a, sort of an internal creative services team. So can really run the gamut from doing um, design of brochures or documents or reports, uh, building out infographics, making videos to communicate all sorts of different things, websites, uh, really kind of overseeing all of that work and how does that come together. And then uh, another part of my job that I tap into uh, going back to that art school dropout is being a bit of a creative and an art director uh, as it kind of comes out here and there. Actually, it's funny, um, Stephanie and I have met uh, previously. She's done some work that I'm going to end up kind of talking about here. And I'd say, yeah, my my kind of damn hat as as I wear it is really being able to talk to Stephanie and uh, tap into that like broader swath of deep technical knowledge, seeing that a big enterprise system and how can we do that? Uh, and me, I'm a little bit more about like, what do we need to do and how are we going to accomplish that? And, and looking at it from a bit of a different perspective. Um, so we do have a digital asset management uh, platform at Destination Canada. We call it the Brand Canada Library. And um, also maybe a little bit contrary to what Stephanie said, we have built an island a little bit with our digital asset management platform. Um, the size and scale of our business and how we work across ourselves and many agencies uh, sort of moving into like an enterprise entirely in-house production process where we tap into the benefit of dam across all of our um, platforms, tools, systems, call them what you will, is kind of like an ongoing journey for us. So we look for those opportunities when we can have them, but we don't have like kind of that integration as like do it now. It's finding how we do that. So we do plug into our website and, and those properties and work back forth from there. Um, don't necessarily plug into like offline uh, or online uh, kind of content production and approval processes at this point in time. But really it was just more of a business decision knowing that like we can't impact, you know, 15 different companies who are doing work for us, it becomes kind of a scale or partnering with different organizations like ourselves. So really our, our digital asset management platform is a bit more of a searchable repository for assets and content. Um, trying to uh, think of ourselves more as like a Getty Images or um, a kind of an Adobe stock um, system is a bit more of the approach that we take. But that it, it doesn't mean we don't have a bit more complexity kind of built behind that. And so that's a little bit of what I'm going to try and uh, illuminate uh, over the next couple uh, bits. Right. So um, one part of how all that comes to life for us is sort of in the discoverability. So really, I want to kind of talk about some of the like some of the parts of our business that have impacted some of the decisions that we've made and how can we be as you know, make our assets as discoverable as possible uh, within the kind of some of the constraints that we that we have. So one of those um, um, inputs for us is legislation. So uh, Destination Canada is a crown corporation of the federal government of Canada. 
Uh, and within that, it means that we need to be fully bilingual. And we need to find a way to kind of uh, work, work that out so that it becomes also manageable for us. So one cue that that led us to decide is that all of our um, cataloging and, and tagging is done via a defined taxonomy. We do almost no free text entry into our, our cataloging process. We may, uh, for some stuff that you would see behind the scenes as a kind of a logged in user who we don't have to worry so much about our bi bilingual nature from, but that kind of put us in a spot where we had to make a make a make a decision on how can we balance the work uh, of cataloging so that it doesn't become unwieldy for us, and uh, and uh, create a product that works out good. The other part of that though is taking a very data informed approach. So when um, this is uh, this system is actually built upon a taxonomy that uh, Dovecot Studios uh, helped us uh, create. Um, so then we are like, okay, like as we were building that, luckily when we were going through this project, we had been on various DAM platforms for quite a long time. So we were really able to go back and look at search data over, over years uh, and also bring in other sort of data inputs into that. And then the last part of that um, for us is really thinking about the system and what system are you on and how can you leverage that? And I bring that up because um, Actually, when we first developed our taxonomy was on one platform, we then moved to another platform that was very flat, so we couldn't have any hierarchy on that. So we had to collapse everything uh, and push it kind of down. Um, didn't really actually work all that well for us. So we've since moved to another platform, uh, kind of a little bit of what you're what you're seeing here. Um, this screenshot shows the site in French. Uh, so that's just sort of a quick uh, slip over to, to showing how, how that works for us. Um, but more so, I think um, where the taxonomy really comes to light for us is in a is in a well created and a well designed facet uh, or kind of filtering system. So for us, when it comes to like discoverability uh, and thinking about how do we design against that and what are those inputs, it's sort of the the mix of these three uh, drove us to sort of where we're where we're at now and how we can do that. We now um, kind of work on a kind of a, a go forward basis. So within this system, we do get to track all the keyword searches, uh, doing all that. We on occasion will inventory our assets, take a look and be like, is there stuff that we're kind of putting in here that just we're not cataloging well, we're not doing that. Um, and we also do use uh, AI as part of our, our work here, but yeah, built upon that that bigger and, and broader, broader system. So. Partly that's in um, kind of like automatic tagging. Um, so this platform behind the scenes has one of those, I can't remember which one it is, uh, built in. So that does do some of the work for us, but we're also actually about to roll out another add-on um, from this platform that will do a better job of um, doing like image searches. So you know if you see something in an image that you like, you can kind of select it or just sort of select the whole image. Uh, and and doing all that. And then also another area where AI is becoming much more helpful in the digital asset management space, I would say is in transcription. Uh, we work a lot in uh, video. Uh, and, you know, um, it's one thing to sort of say like, hey, we produce this like two and a half minute video. Um, and so we can easily transcribe that and put a, you know an, an SRT file or other kind of transcription uh, device into the system. But if you put in like 90 minutes of an interview, that's much harder to do. So uh, this platform uh, is, we're kind of working on that. And it just makes your videos that much more searchable uh, and, and uh, ups on that level of discoverability. Um, the other thing that I kind of want to talk about is a little bit about user-centric design and how that has come to, to life for us. Um, in this case, we sort of think about like different user types. So as a business, you know, we have uh, various kind of, um, I guess I would call them audiences that we're trying to hit. So it may be um, somebody like a freelance journalist in Germany who wants to write a story about Canada, or uh, maybe in Australia, it's a person who owns like a trade company, like a travel company, uh, thinking like uh, sort of Canadian vacations or flight center, uh, those uh, sorts of uh, things. We also work within kind of a broader tourism marketing space. So it could be that somebody from like destination British Columbia or travel Ontario, uh, we'd want to come in. So we really think about those different user types 
and think about like, okay, like what do they need? What, what's their sort of most uh, common need and how do they how do they need it? But then also um, a huge part of our work is thinking about licenses and license management. We work with assets that come from a like large swath of creators and creatives. We uh, really aim, just trying to think of my own time check. Am I like pretty much at time? Pretty close. It's pretty close. Okay. <laughs> so thinking, thinking about license management, how do those come into play and ease of access? And basically what that allowed us to set up was um, we built this system in a way where your first um, kind of port of entry, we give you 600 images free to download. You don't need to create an account. If you just want to grab something and go, grab it and go um, and do that. And then trying to set people up so that they will log in, go through an approval process uh, and then they can get access to more. And then that's where we can uh, do more uh, more control over stuff. And in my recap slides, so I'm glad that I'm pretty much at time. I, I really believe that design is everywhere, um, whether it's trying to think about how you swath out to a whole system, which I don't always do that, versus the how does it come to life? Like, what is the sort of product that comes out of that? Um, and I, I find that my digital asset management experience kind of helps me in that realm and space. And I will stop sharing because that, wow, that was fast. Time flies when you're looking at moose or elks or whatever those were, Adam. That are... it's, it's a wonderful part of my job is I have access to a million pretty pictures so that I can oh, slot into my presentations. I'll bet so. Well, thanks so much for putting that together uh, for us. And it, it's so interesting to think about so many ways in which the taxonomy that you use around these assets has to serve so many different ways of questions being asked. And uh, if there are some questions for Adam, if you'll send them along, we'll send them to him. But we will stay, uh, stick a bit to our schedule. And Adam, thank you so much for your preparation and for sharing with colleagues across Canada and across the world today. Thank you. Okay. Reem, I think we are going to turn the camera over to you. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to announce the last giveaways. And this one is really, really interesting. So this is actually coming from an, also another indigenous organization that has a really great name. The name is Damn Fine Food. And so the winner of the Damn Fine Food is Emily Kroket. So Emily, congratulations. Um, so Damn Fine Food, they actually also, uh, they have a really nice jam, but it's uh, with with, uh, with uh, a little bit of spicy stuff, but this is really great. Uh, so we will be in touch with you uh, for, uh, for your giveaways. Congratulations. Great, Reem. Thanks for that. And then it's a Saskatchewan-based company, and we just found it irresistible that it was called Damn Fine Food. It was just too much. So for our next presentation, we're going to see some more of the winners, um, candidate winners from our terrific creative work that's been developed under Reedham's teaching and with, in and amongst the colleagues who've collaborated together. Reen, yes. over to you. Thank you. So before the break, we shared the first set of the Dam Creative uh, students. And now I'm going to show the uh, next set of the candidates. And then after the video, we are going to announce the winner of the Dam Creative uh, Award. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and today I wanted to kind of talk about my infographic that I created about uh, DAM systems, digital asset management systems. So I created my infographic based on AI and machine learning in DAM. So as we know, AI is ever growing and I wanted to talk about how important it is with metadata, tagging, content recognition, search and retrieval, predictive analysis, also automation and also improving search engine optimization that goes in hand with search and retrieval. I wanted to make my infographic about this because these are all very critical aspects of a damn system. And especially in today's day and age where AI is a critical part of our everyday lives and it's everywhere we look. And also with 
having the experience of building a dam from the ground up with my classmates and the help of my professor during my class and my time at TMU was awesome. At the beginning, I was like, what is this? And with Reem's help and having that hands-on experience really helped solidify what a dam is and how actually crucially and critically important it is within businesses that have many assets. So anyways, thank you so much for your time. And I really do appreciate this opportunity and I wish everyone the best of luck and enjoy the rest of, rest of the symposium. Thanks, bye. Hi, my name is Bea. During the fall semester, I got the opportunity to learn the foundations of digital asset management within the graphic communications industry. Through this course, I got to research about how to implement a digital asset management or a dam governance plan. I got to reintroduce this topic into an informative video and define the four pillars of a dam governance, user groups, metadata, assets, and upload workflow. My video consists of the key questions to ask ourselves when thinking about how to manage the four pillars. I had so much fun creating this video from editing the motion graphics from Canva to adding sound effects throughout the video, all while learning about the policies and procedures that keeps a dam organized and sustainable. I hope you enjoy the video as much as I enjoyed creating it. Hi, I'm Celaya Gonzalez, and as a TMU graphic communication student, I'm frequently tasked with managing and organizing digital files for assignments or even for my own organizational benefits. Recently, I completed a digital asset management course and it has significantly enhanced my skills. The course covered the best practices organizing, storing, and retrieving digital assets efficiently. All this while working with industry experts to gain valuable insight from real world applications. One of the most valuable lessons I learned was how to implement metadata standards. This has taught me how to streamline a workflow by reducing the time spent searching for assets and increasing overall productivity. Overall, the DAM course taught me the best ways to use this tool and how important it is for an industry. This is why I decided to explain a few of the best practices in a short and fun video. If you're looking to enhance your digital asset management skills, I highly recommend taking a DAM course. It's been an eye-opening experience and I hope more of our industry can learn about it. So the moment of the truth, I just want to tell you that uh, the uh, how did we actually come up to those 10 people? We did. I did ask multiple dam experts uh, around uh, like different uh, places, including our sponsor to pick the uh, the winner. And we also asked our uh, guest speaker to do that. It was super hard to pick the best winner. So the initial uh, the initial plan was to award two students, but we have a tie. Again, so we are going to give uh, the award for three students. The student who won the Dam Creative Award this year are Sarah Hope, Jasmine Dawi, and Bia Trono. Congratulations. And uh, you will be uh, receiving a gift card from, uh, from us. And, and thank you so much. Congratulations, student. And we look forward to seeing that on all of your resumes when you're entering the dam field or wherever yes. you're working in creative operations. Yes, yes, yes. And we'll be a part of it no matter where that is. Yes. 
Okay. So, and I think uh, next is my presentation. I think next is indeed your presentation. So it is my presentation. Okay. So I want to thank you everyone for actually joining us today. I am going to actually uh, talk a little bit about our program and also talk about the uh, the LED. Allow me uh, first to uh, give you a, a quick background about myself for those who doesn't know me. Uh, Dr. Rimal Asali, I am an associate professor at the School of Graphic Communication Management. Uh, I am the director and co-founder of the Lab of Excellent in Digital Asset Management. Um, I'm also a member of TMU Graduate City in the Master, uh, Master of Digital Media Program and the PhD Program in Media uh, and Design Innovation Program. I'm affiliated to the Creative AI Hub at uh, the uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, and I'm a proud instructor for a, a very unique uh, digital asset management course in the undergraduate level. And I have been fortunate to be awarded uh, the Dean Teaching Award uh, for teaching excellence for teaching this, uh, this course. Uh, for those who doesn't know Toronto Metropolitan University, it used to be known as Ryerson, and we changed uh, the name to TMU. It's located in the uh, heart of the Midtown. It is the most applied university uh, in Ontario. We have so many different connections with the uh, international connection. We have so many different programs, and we recently opened um, a medicine, a, a medical uh, uh, school in uh, Brampton. We also have so many diverse research institute and uh, lab. Our main faculty called the Creative School Faculty. My our GCM program is the one part of those uh, uh, of the Creative School. The Creative School consists of a nine different professional uh, school, including fashion, including uh, including interior design, professional communication, journalism, um, performance, and the graphic communication. We do have so many different uh, programs, like the music professional program, uh, GCM uh, uh, program, and other. Uh, program. We also have seven different innovation hubs and four international uh, international uh, hubs. The School of uh, Graphic Communication is the only school that provides bachelor degree uh, program in printing and packaging technology in Canada. Um, we have a huge number of uh, students and we are well known of our small classes and hands-on uh, lab. We do have so a different uh, concentration, business, uh, pub uh, publishing, packaging, and uh, digital, uh, digital output. This is like a, a quick screenshot of our, our lab. We do have so many uh, different labs. This is one of the uh, the uh, lab. We have also a process because we teach printing. And uh, this is, we have so many different uh, printers. And we also uh, teach uh, packaging and publishing and, and bind, uh, binding book. So this is some sample of actual student, uh, student work. We also do uh, t-shirt printing. We do book and publishing and uh, so as you can see we have we come from a creative uh, background so the two pictures that you see are my actually my student in the uh, digital asset uh, management uh, course so as i mentioned we uh, one of the core courses that we teach at uh, gcm is called asset management for graphic communication i have an average of 104 students taking uh, this uh, this course uh, so despite the concentration they have to uh, take uh, that course so it consists of a lecture where we actually learn everything you can think of in digital asset management. And we also use our lab to actually build an asset management. So the student uh, student uh, build a dump for an imaginary uh, company. They go through the whole implementation from uh, selecting the asset until actually uh, having the, uh, the, the asset ready, metadata, taxonomy, right management, AI also, all of that in 12 weeks only. 
Um, we use a lot of uh, uh, a lot of interactive uh, uh, tools, as you can see. I use toys, I use candies, I use uh, images to teach them um, metadata and taxonomy. We use Lego uh, uh, as well. This is also for an interactive um, activity. And we uh, we believe in the uh, the importance of connecting with the uh, industry. So I have been fortunate to be able to connect with industry coming in as my guest uh, my guest speaker is as you can see one of our really great guest speaker, Mr. David Levsey himself was uh, one of our guest speaker at uh, the uh, dam uh, event uh, at the, the dam course. And as you saw, the Dam Creative, this is an assignment that has been going on for uh, almost uh, uh, three years so far. Uh, so the student actually uh, create, um, they pick a topic in Dam and they recreate it in uh, a creative uh, way. We have games, uh, we have video, and we have info, uh, info uh, uh, graphic. And as David mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, what we did, we uh, David and I actually having so much fun with doing this. We uh, we uh, connect with the dam expert to be a mentors uh, to mentor the student during their journey over uh, the creation of uh, their dam. And we also uh, have judges who judge the last presentation uh, of their work. Uh, we always look for uh, additional um, uh, like mentors. So if you are interested, please reach out uh, to me. Uh, we will be uh, teaching the course again in the, uh, in the fall in the fall term. Um, I have been fortunate to be able to uh, actually take a couple of students uh, at the uh, well-known Henry Seward uh, Asset Management uh, event in, uh, in New York. Um, I also present uh, there in 2020. Um, and I am also running uh, a funding, a crowdfunding campaign uh, where you have the QR code that it will take you. Uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to uh, fund uh, taking student again uh, to 2024 uh, event. I think this is uh, going to create a great opportunity for the student uh, to be actually introduced in this world, connected to uh, the industry, uh, having the ability to uh, network and share experience and build their uh, experience in the asset management. So I'm looking forward. Any contribution can help. So, um, so uh, please uh, spread the word and uh, let's all get together in supporting the next generation of dam leaders. Um, the Lab of Excellence, David and I work so hard in actually having this finally a place where community can get together. It's the only uh, academic research lab that is available to actually uh, focus on uh, research and education in uh, digital asset management. And it's a place where we build a, a community. Uh, our hope that we will be able to uh, find a place not only to support the industry, but also to support uh, the future, the next generation, where we connect them with the uh, with the uh, industry. We offer a lot of uh, our workshop. All of them are virtual, uh, are free to attend and pre-recorded. All of them you can find them in uh, in uh, our website. Uh, we hope we the focus is to spread the knowledge. Uh, this is some of the uh, the uh, the event that we hosted. We also hosted this year. We hosted two events: one to discussing digital preservation and one discussing uh, asset management implementation in tourism and tourism sector. Uh, all of them are again uh, available on the website and we're looking also forward in providing more, uh, more of these in the upcoming years. Uh, what what uh, for what the uh, the other main objective of the asset uh, uh, of the LED lab is to advocate for research. So uh, you uh, heard uh, you heard the previous presentation by uh, Dr. Thompson uh, about uh, her mobile project, which was the first project that we uh, collaborate together in LED. 
Um, I'm also uh, happy to also uh, announce that we I'm also working on another funded uh, research. This research is uh, focused on uh, investigating uh, opportunity challenge in uh, implementing asset management in destination market and specifically Ontario uh, destination market. For this specific research, I'm collaborating uh, with Dr. Chris Gibbs from uh, the uh, Hospitality and Tourism uh, Program at TMU as well. Uh, I am, we are looking for interviewer, so uh, find more information about uh, the uh, interviews that we are looking for in our website. Uh, please help us to spread the, uh, the, the word, um, and we are hoping to share the funding of our research by, um, by the fall. The other interesting uh, funded research that is going to start in the fall, this one is focusing on uh, exploring the intersection of generative AI, asset management, specifically in the uh, graphic communication uh, management sector. And this is what we where we uh, come from. There is no research so far that actually focus on this kind of intersection. There is a lot of research that focus on generative uh, AI or AI and asset management, but there is no research that connect uh, all together. So this research is going to start also in the fall uh, semester. We will be also looking for survey and uh, inter uh, interviewers uh, as well. So the LED lab is uh, actually focused on, uh, aside from other uh, other stuff, the area that we are uh, looking into advanced uh, uh, asset management is uh, technology innovation, uh, workflow automation, business model uh, and uh, management, and uh, special and uh, social impact. Uh, there are also other uh, like in progress, uh, also uh, research that uh, I am working on um, and apply for a grant, which I'm hoping that uh, I'm going to announce about it like uh, soon. Um, so this is an open invitation um, for any, if there's any opportunity that we can uh, collaborate in research, we have people, we have the skills uh, that we can support your uh, industry in uh, answering any challenging question in the realm of uh, the uh, digital asset management. And I wanna take this opportunity again to thank everyone for joining us uh, today. And uh, over to you, David. Reem, thanks so much. It's always a delight to see how see the growth of what you have done with your leadership and the reach around the, the world of what's going on at LED. And for we welcome our community's involvement, as you can see from the thesis and the, and the tenor of Reem's presentation. As we, we spoke at, we spoke of throughout these presentations and as I spoke of at the beginning, there the opportunity for an employer to look today for a highly trained professional in digital asset management just gets better and better. Part of the reason for that is that we finally have undergraduate education in digital asset management. Another key part of this is for the last four and a half years, Rutgers University has offered a professional training program and it works hand in hand with the teaching that goes on at, at TMU, a professional education program in digital asset management. This encompasses a basic certificate in DAM, a professional certificate, and it is professional education. We also have advanced uh, certifications in digital asset management and the GLAM or gallery libraries, archive museum and performing arts world in advanced DAM practices in DAM and AI and starting in September in advanced creative operations. The majority of these are now fully digitally badged, and by next year, everything will be fully digitally badged. It's a delight that we get to offer a seat in one of the advanced certificate programs today, and we have a fun way that we're going to do this. So we've put everyone's name into essentially it's kind of like the wheel of fortune except it's the wheel of education and reem are we ready to spin that and and max yeah. are we ready max you can share your so, screen here goes
All right, Brandon. So Brendan, congratulations. Um, Reem and I will be in touch with you and I will work with you along with the staff at Rutgers about the enrollment procedures. It's a really uh, terrific, you'll, you'll join a terrific cohort and get a lot out of this. And we hope you too will become an ambassador for the importance of education and digital asset management. Reem, any concluding remarks that you can share with us, please? Thank you so much. Uh, I want to first uh, uh, thank all our guest speakers for the great presentation that we had. Uh, thank you for all uh, the attendees for supporting us and for joining us uh, today. And most importantly, thank you for our sponsor. Because of you, we were able to actually host this kind of uh, event. Uh, today, uh, today marks the fourth annual uh, Canada uh, Symposium, and tomorrow is going to mark the 10th anniversary. Now we can wait for uh, for that. Um, we are here to uh, uh, build a community. We are here to support the community. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today, and congratulations to the uh, student uh, for their uh, them uh, creating. And I want to say thank a special thank you for Mr. David Lipsy for believing in us and for supporting in us all the way to make the dream of having the LED lab come through. Thank you so much, David. You're welcome. Good day, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We've got about every time zone on the planet here. Reem, thanks a lot. This concludes the fourth annual Dam for Canada Coast to Coast Symposium. Good day, everyone. Good day, everyone.